Hey, hey, this is Cedric, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And before we get into this awesome rip with Laser Hoddle, I want to tell you about our amazing sponsors. The only way to truly own your Bitcoin is to get your Bitcoin off your exchange and into a hardware wallet that you control. Now make sure that you secure your Bitcoin from physical disaster and a single point of failure with a Cypher Grid seed storage device. It's the best value in the industry because you get everything you need for $59. BIP39 compatible, two stainless steel plates for all 24 seed words, not just one plate of 12 words. This seed storage device has privacy by default. Stainless steel hardware to hold it together can be locked with a padlock, tamper evidence seal provided, automatic center punch provided. Just like all CypherSafe products, it's made from stainless steel and is fireproof, rustproof, and waterproof. To keep your SAT safe, go to cyphersafe.io and use the code MATRIX to get 10% off your order. Ledin is pleased to announce that starting on February 1st, annual interest on newly opened Ledin loans will be decreasing to 8.9% from 9.5%. An improvement on their cost of capital is what is allowing them to reduce your cost of financing your Bitcoin. You can take advantage of these improved terms today by accessing some dollar liquidity with a dollar loan, or you can increase your Bitcoin holdings with a B2X loan to make the most of the risk of the recent dip in Bitcoin's price. Listeners of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast get $50 free in USDC when you become a Ledin user and take out a Ledin loan using our link. To learn more, sign up at start.ledn.io forward slash Bitcoin matrix. Between working from home, mandates and lockdowns, you might be thinking about adding an extra room at the house or renting a place to escape or retreat from encroaching communism. Citadel Cabins is in the custom building industry, and they are famous for small log cabins that can be shipped anywhere and easily assembled by you and a couple of friends in just a few days without any specialized skills or power tools required. Imagine adding a room to your house or dropping a cabin in the woods. As we descend deeper and deeper into clown world, the cabins are creating a way for families like mine to escape and establish KYC-free location sovereignty, surrounded by people who care about freedom as much as we do. Or maybe you wanna get off the grid completely. Citadel Cabins is a Bitcoin-only company that exists that exists to help individuals achieve shelter, rest, security, and location independence. Head over to citadelcabins.com for more information and to fill out an application now. Bitcoin 2022 is the largest Bitcoin event in the world that takes place April 6th to 9th in Miami Beach, Florida. All four days will be jam-packed with exclusive content, exciting announcements, and an incredible lineup of Bitcoin speakers, artists, and leaders. Day one is industry day for enterprising Bitcoiners who are looking to build a business or career within the ecosystem. Days two and three are general, general conference days featuring speakers like El Salvador President Nayib Bukele, who has promised a big surprise, as well as CEOs like Michael Saylor, Elizabeth Stark, Jack Mahlers, Adam Back, and hundreds more. The conference caps off on the fourth day with the world's first and largest Bitcoin music festival. Sound Money Fest, headlined by rapper and fellow Bitcoiner Logic, Steve Aoki, CL, Run the Jewels, San Holo, Dead Mal 5, and many more. Last year's conference sold out, and this year's is on pace to be three times larger. So make sure you grab your tickets before it's too late. Visit b.tc forward slash conference to learn more. Ticket prices increase on February 18th. Pay in Bitcoin to save and use promo code Bitcoin Matrix for 10% off, and I will see you in Miami. And now let's enter the Bitcoin Matrix with Laser Hoddle for this fascinating and super insightful conversation on monetary reset, central banking imperialism, and how governments want to upgrade the legal system to a software system, and why Bitcoin is their worst nightmare. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. 
What do you do? You get out. Laser Hoddle is an anonymous Twitter handle helping families navigate reset. He believes that tokens are time theft. Saving is justice. Opt out at every layer. He's a Bitcoin citizen who advocates that people get on zero fiat as soon as possible. Laser Hoddle, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix. How are you? Hey, Cedric. Thanks for having me. I'm great. Yeah, man. I'm super excited. We've had this in the works for a while. And even more importantly, I, I've been excited about your work for a while and, and sort of the signal that you've brought to Bitcoin Twitter. Um, one of the things I love is that you're synonymous and uh, it's really just discussing your ideas. And uh, so really the only question that I have around uh, some of maybe your choices in terms of the public sphere is, is how'd you pick your profile picture? Yeah, so this uh, photo is, um, it, 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 it's from the front cover of the first edition print of uh, True Names. True Names is the novella that started the entire cypherpunk movement. Um, uh, it, basically, it talks about a world where um, the government had reached a stage of high-tech totalitarianism that the only freedom that remained was in cyberspace. Uh, so then there's this, this group of uh, freedom fighters in cyberspace come together to ultimately undermine the totalitarian state and cement the individual. And so I just think it's such an iconic read, so critical for Bitcoiners to have on their shelves and, and, and uh, get at that I went with the front cover of the first edition. So laser hodl, uh, actually, I, my... My, my initial handle was Hokkaido Laser. Hokkaido Laser was one of the two government satellites in True Names that they used to um, uh, turn off dissidents. <laughs> so they actually had uh, weapon equipped satellites. Um, one was Hokkaido Laser and the other was Finger of God. Um, and so I started as Hokkaido Laser. Then there was this uh, trend of folks naming uh, themselves, you know, so and so hodl. Right. And I saw that laser hodl was available and I just thought, you know, that's a lot cleaner and more memorable. So I switched to laser hodl and the rest is uh, history. Yeah. Something about your, your account and, and what you've been putting out has definitely struck a chord. And, you know, I'd love to jump into your hypothesis. So, you know, just to back out a bit, what, what is monetary reset? Like, how do we just sort of set the stage or, or frame it out from there? Yeah. So, you know, the nation state is more or less, you can look at it as a business. It has a balance sheet. It has assets. It has liabilities. Um, the nation state is funded by money printing. So by debt, credit creation, not taxes. Taxes are actually a breaking mechanism that prevent the 99% from overheating the economy. That's a money velocity thing. Um, and it, it keeps the Cantillon window open as long as possible. Um, so that folks who are getting new money first are able to maximize that arbitrage. Um, but the state is funded by money printing itself. People have a sense like the debt ceiling. They know that the, the government's run up huge debts. They don't understand where the underlying assets for that debt come mm -hmm. from. Right. So they just they have a sense that, you know, we're fiscally irresponsible. You know, we're constantly raising the debt ceiling. It's, it's astronomical uh, degrees of debt. Um, they, what, what the average folks doesn't connect is that that's actually how the government funds itself. It doesn't fund itself on taxes. In fact, if, if the government was forced to fund itself on taxes, that would be an improvement um, because that would force into the, um, the, the political dialogue um, a, a conversation about budgeting, which right now there's no constraint because you're pulling directly out of money creation, credit creation, money printing. Um, and so... Uh, that the act of funding um, a state on uh, money printing creates cycles. You get two cycles. You get a small cycle. Most people know this, the business cycle. And um, you end up with these booms and busts. And, and actually, a lot of people, it's in recent memory, Occupy Wall Street, you know, people are starting to get very frustrated with the small business cycle because it created these companies, these corporations that were too big to fail. And so they would print a bunch of money bail out those corporations and you know we, we there was some activism and some sort of 
popular awareness of the, of the um, money printing as it relates to the small business cycle, because we all felt that, hey, Main Street was getting fleeced to bail out Wall Street, right? So people, that's in recent memory. Um, but that's about as far out as the average person is able to zoom. If you zoom out even further, you'll see there's a large debt cycle too. And instead of bailing out corporations in the large debt cycle, you're bailing out the nation state itself. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, the way to think about that is uh, they, they print a bunch of money. The government centralizes, concentrates power. Um, it operates this way. And at some point, it has more debt than its GDP is able to ser- service. Um, and, and you have a deleveraging. Um, you can deleverage in a handful of ways. You can... You can um, you can melt up like a hyperinflation um, or you could, you could have the bottom fall out uh, like a deflationary spiral. In practice, they actually both have the same outcome, which is a chaotic vanishing, a purchasing power, um, a loss of confidence in government money. Um, and so then what, what, what the nation state has to do is the very dangerous business of resetting balance sheets, reinstating faith in government money, and uh, to do that, they, they need to pause uh, society, pause. Um, uh, they need to suspend the rule of law, suspend, um, you know. Mm. Well, let me put it this way. You, you, if people knew that what we were going through right now was actually the greatest sovereign default of all time and that the monetary system had actually failed, um, there would be huge amounts of anger and duress directed at the state. Um, and so the, the state's in a precarious position because one, it's addicted to debt. It needs debt to run. Two, it, it, it can't allow the world to understand that it needs to use the world's life savings to bail itself out um, because it doesn't want to be toppled. It doesn't want to be, you know, the, the, the absolute chaos that would come from that. And people realize it's all coming down because of fiscal irresponsibility, because of money printing, because of the delusions and time theft of Keynesian economics. And so what they really need to do is is kind of bring their subjects to heal, um, pause society. People need to be more or less put on a form of house arrest while they're doing that very dangerous surgery um, to the monetary system, to their balance sheets. And as you can imagine, in, in this um, period of monetary reset, the monetary order on, in the world stage is also destabilized. It becomes malleabilized. And so um, this, you're, you're likely to see war, you're likely to, because you're getting a reconfiguring of the monetary order in large. You know, the, the world economy is, is tightly coupled, it's tightly connected. So, so um, it, it, if like the reserve asset, like the dollar faces a tragedy, that, that's not, insul- you know, there's not a single country on earth that can insulate themselves from that. So um, mm-hmm. you, you have a global uh, unraveling of confidence in government money, and that requires governments to bring their subjects to heel so that they don't have uh, chaos, revolt, uh, the toppling of nations, um, and so that they can manage that. Um, and so the, the, that in a nutshell is, is what monetary reset mm-hmm. is. You need to solve for when the sovereign nations themselves are broke, when they are so far underwater that the, the, the system becomes um, uh, in disrepair. You can no longer pump it full of, you know, another way to think about it is the everything bubble. It's going to come down at some point. Um, they, you know, they can reinflate it as many times as, as, they, as they think is viable, but at some point they recognize it's coming down. And so when it's coming down, what do you do? Do you let everyone kind of figure it out and just hope it works out and you have this organic revolution? No, of course not. Of course, what you would do is you would have a, ma- a managed, you would let it down in a managed way um, and reboot this, this very brittle and fragile monetary system in a controlled way. And so I think what we're experiencing is the careful controlled demolition of the monetary system, um, the, the, the house arrest of the world while they're doing that. And, and to put it frankly, the upgrade of the state, they're, they're, they're upgrading um, the facilities of, of government to prepare for a new um, long cycle.
Right. Yeah, I, I really get a lot of what you're saying there. I mean, I get a lot of it distilled. You distilled a lot of it for me with your tweets, um, with your pods and, and this conversation now. And I kind of want to get more grounded in, in what this might have looked like in the past, because, you know, what we're kind of describing here is, is something we're going through. And most people haven't gone through a, a large, long cycle of 70 years. But obviously, these things have happened before. What I'm also getting is that there's you know, uh, maybe in the short cycles, government can bail itself out, but government can't bail out government at the end of the day. And, and so it, it kind of, you know, kind of strikes that maybe there's a there's a some sort of centralized power beyond the governments, uh, whether that is, is that centralized banking. And maybe what are some of the mechanisms of reset that we did see maybe in World War Two, the last time I think we went through this? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think so governments have partnered with central banks um, for the service of creating money, for, for constructing the, this monetary system such that uh, money uh, credit creation can happen. Uh, that's not a free service. We pay central bank to do that. Uh, we pay them an interest. And at some point the bills do, and it's very clear to everyone involved that the interest cannot be serviced. Um, and, and, and so you have a reckoning, right? You have a, a bill collecting moment where uh, the, and, and, and this is where you get something like, um, you know, the, like a hyperinflation, you know, increased money printing that's excavating productive capital, available capital. Um, and that ends up in, you know, that capital ends up in the hands of a few. I think, I think um, you know, that, that's one way to think about it. It's, it's from nation states, essentially are, are in debt servitude to central banks. Uh, and those central banks are acquiring the assets of the world. I mean, when, when you look at uh, kind of the pitch of the World Economic Forum for this monetary reset, the Great Reset, throughout that whole thing is a tone of, um, you know, the 99% of the world not owning anything. Um, the reason they suspect that'll be the case is because they understand the asset ownership, the cap table of the world. They understand that um, that has already largely been centralized. You know, we're, we're actually not so far from that already, right? Um, and so, you know, if you were to use central banks to, for example, start purchasing uh, homes, right? Um, you know, what mm -hmm. asset does the 90% really own? What's left, right? And so um, already we're in this feedback loop where, um, where the 99% is, is losing their assets. They're being forced to sell because of inflation. So all you have to do is put in place the asset purchasing programs, and then it, it's an inevitability. You get to where most people don't own a single thing. They're renting. It's, it's, it's the rent everything economy. Um, and, and so asset ownership is being dematerialized. And at the same time, um, work is being dematerialized. People are going from sort of steady careers into kind of, you know, everything's the gig economy, contracting. And so, um, you know, fiat economics, money printing e economics is, is creating this extreme centralization and dematerialization dematerial of asset ownership. Um, and, and, and so that trend's not new, you know, part of my hypothesis is that, um, you know, we're actually in a new type of world war right now. Mm -hmm. Um, an, an info war, a psychological war, maybe a little bit of a bio, bio war, um, certainly a Malthusian, a Malthusian war. Um, and, and but, but the, you know, but that's being precipitated by sovereign default, right? That's not, um, and, and the idea is, is that uh, there's never going to be more opportunity than in this decade to roll up the West, to consolidate the nation state into sort of a, a new global state. You know, the, the um, uh, after World War II, um, you had a lot of, you know, this, this globalist kind of movement really started. You had uh, the IMF, you had the World Bank, SDRs um, first started, the SDR, which is the proposed backing bucket for world money. Uh, those came on the scene and, and they started allocating to member countries. And, and uh, Let's say ESGs were not long after um, the, the, the BIS started um, uh, aggregating central banks in, in mass at that point. So you really did start having um, all the pieces of a world government at that point. And it slowly ramped up. But since uh, 2020, it's all hockey sticked. Um, 
uh, SDRs is going on every balance sheet and it's it's going parabolic. The, the, the center of gravity for money printing is leaving the dollar and moving into SDRs. Um, you know, right. I, I think what we'll probably see there is a bunch of CBDC experiments that are backed by SDRs. SDRs actually represent the hard assets and GDP of the member countries. So mm. you ask the question, how are they going to restore faith in government money? Uh, you know, it might be that the answer is um, by backing um, CBDCs with the wealth of the world vis-a-vis SDRs. Meaning you're, you're, renting, you're renting your lifestyle, you're renting things that are salient and you know they're salient um, because the underlying security represents all the wealth that central banks have clawed <laughs> back from, you know, ha- have sort of uh, excavated from humanity. Um, so, so, so um, but, but, but this, this trend is, you know, yeah, it goes back to the 70s, but you could look at World War One and World War Two as kind of a reset event as well. It's, it, it's, um, and what was that you know, one like? Like, like how, what, what was reset there besides maybe just the money? Uh, was the, was the, were countries and nations reset? Is, is that why we got the European Union? Is that sort of this, was that a move to centralize things? What was accomplished? What was learned maybe by the, the, these centralized powers uh, through that experience? Well, I, I, you know, I think you want to look at it from the point of view of like central banking imperialism. And so um, in, in the late 1600s, you had the first uh, uh, central bank, uh, uh, Bank of Amsterdam, Bank of England was not that far after. First Bank of the United States was not that far after. All central banks, and you could track their behavior, and you could track changes to the monetary system since then. Um, so, so I, I think what you'll see is there's a sprawling international central banking presence that is becoming ever present in Western countries and even the East. Um, and that they've made significant uh, uh, changes in terms of softening and dislocating uh, the economies of the, the, the largest nations on earth from, um, from a sort of hard money reality. Um, so, uh, so for example, um, uh, uh, after World War II, um, central banks installed a, an upgraded version of Bank of Japan um, uh, and mm-hmm. put them on a fiat standard and has since completely excavated the Japanese people's um, uh, sovereign wealth and time and, and their life savings, really their future. Um, and and that's, that's a form of like monetary colonialization. Um, mm-hmm. They lost, they lost World War II and in return, they get a Western central bank. They get folded in to the central banking um, uh, empire, I should call it. Um, the United States, we actually broke away, from, you know, it wasn't about tea and taxes. It was about debasement and, 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 and claims over seniorage, right? We were using um, English money um, thousands of miles away, and we were on the receiving end of debasement from uh, the Bank of England. We broke away from that and have since had nonstop struggle within the U.S. to, you know, I know the first bank of the United States was the central bank that uh, George Washington eventually got rid of, and it came back through the Federal Reserve Act. Um, and, and the people behind the Federal Reserve Act are the same people from the Bank of England. It's the international banking clique um, uh, installing this sprawling um, empire. And so um, I think in World War I, uh, the, the, let's see, is that World War I or World War II? Um, uh, you, you had a, um, a, a shakeup in, in Europe, um, and they dragged the United States into it by sinking the Lusitania. I think it was World War I, right. sinking the Lusitania, and, um, and, and that pulled us into um, a big conflict. And, you know, you, you kind of follow that forward to, um, uh, to the, the Federal Reserve Act. You see the fishy business in World War I and World War II um, on, you know, we have a story of what happened about World War One and World War Two. That it was this these conflicts between nations. You know, Hitler with this uh, fight for survival. You know, in 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 Europe, this 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 bizarre worldview about race superiority, and you have the Soviet Union where they had a bizarre worldview about class 
conflict. So we have the, the saga, the dramatization that we, that we learn, but none of us learn it through the, the lens of money. And, and so, you know, I, I, I think what, like what I would say is you want to think forward from that, like what's happened since then. And since then, um, central banks have been installed in every single country of, of, of World, War I, one, World War I and World War II. Wealth has been extremely centralized since then, concentrated. And um, the sovereignty of these nations have eroded in tandem with that. Um, and, and so I think, you know, uh, G. Edward Griffith, he wrote the creature on Jekyll Island. Mm -hmm. He has a quote I really love. Um, All wars are banking wars. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of think of like the show Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, um, all, all the conflicts within that show are, are fruitful to the Iron Bank because it can, it can, you know, a conflict is a shakeup and, and that means a shakeup of asset ownerships. And you can fund on both ends, you can fund with debt um, and, and, and get both ends of the action. And so I think I, I think kind of similarly, if I had a sprawling central bank uh, empire, um, these conflicts are, are fruitful. When, when I have a, a nation that's on my balance sheet that is now broke, that owes me, how can I get repayment, right? One way of repayment is to go out and lay claim to sovereign assets and force reparations, force asset transfers. And I think that's what we see in uh, a world war. I think it's a form of financial reset. Um, it also creates growth industry, right? So it's actually mm -hmm. also, it's also a way to, to stimulate and jumpstart a, a nation that is basically at the end of its rope in terms of um, a fiduciary health. Um, so, so, you know, from, from the point of view of like um, a, a central banking as a business to harvest human time, mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, when you get to the end of where a country can no longer service um, the, the debt, that, the, the, the interest on the debt that they owe you, I, you know, having a couple answers for how you could go about that, like how you might uh, address that is useful. And I think war is always going to be kind of like in the back pocket because it, it, it has the, the, the multi-pronged effect of one, uh, it embroils the citizenry in, in, in fear and trauma. So they, they basically become uh, uh, kind of paralyzed they're huddling under the state, waiting for orders. Um, and that buys you several years to actually do this economic surgery. Um, the society is completely malleableized. So you can upgrade any parts of society that you need. You can make changes um, in, in a broad sense during world war. And so you see a lot of policy tools show up in war and, and policy changes that stick around. Um, I, it, it, it gives you, it, it allows you to lay claim to new assets. So hard assets, natural resources, um, land, claims on GDP. Um, and it allows you to expand the central banking empire. So, I, you know, I think that that's, um, it, it, it's kind of like the, the go-to um, for, you know, when a large country becomes uh, in debt servitude to central banks, at some point, it, 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 uh, they can no longer, <laughs> at some point, they're basically at the end of the rope in terms of they need more debt to sustain themselves or they will collapse in a very ugly way, you know, war, famine, civil war, you name it. And they have to go back to, the, to their, their debt suitors to which they are indebted to and say, look, we're in a terribly des desperate place. And I, and I believe central banks are merely saying, look, here's what we can do. Mm. Here's what we like. Here's how we can actually deliver you through because we're going to have to do some, some pretty uh, nasty business to, to reset your balance sheets. And of course, it's not going to be the type where the debts are just forgiven, right? Hey, let's, let's, let's reset the monopoly board. And um, I, I, I don't see that that's how it would work. So like the TLDR is um, these nation states run themselves on debt. It's not sustainable. You get these big nasty cycles, um, the same people that they go to to help manage those downturns um, need to be compensated in some manner. The assets and the wealth has to come from somewhere. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 you know, that's why, I, you know, war is really a balance sheet maneuver. Um, and, 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 you know, you can look at a balance sheet and say, okay, look, Let's look at the liability. Let's review the liabilities. Let, tell me a story about how you're going to reduce liabilities. 
and tell me a, a story about how you're going to um, generate new profit streams, new new growth story, new industry, right? And in wars, a wars, a uh, it works. It works for that. It, it, you know, if and so, but I I think after World War II, you know, after the atom bomb, and and now we have mm. complete nuclear proliferation. The um, I'm not I'm not so sure that they can go down that route anymore. Right, because the collateral damage from like an all-out nuclear war is probably too much to tolerate. Like that kind of breaks the game, um, and so I think they're in a, a really weird place. Where okay, so now we're entering the greatest sovereign default of all time. We have entered it in 2020. Um, what do you do? <laughs> what exactly do you do? And um, and it can't be just a hot war. Um, and I think they've been struggling with that. Um, that and a handful of other uh, um, political theories they've been struggling with for uh, for since the 70s. Um, what are we going to do next? Um, the 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 game on hot war can't go on. I think they've mm-hmm. chased it down every rudimentary place on earth, like into the desert in the Middle East. Like there's they're running out of places to do this right. million do- military industrial complex shtick. Mm. So um, something so something has to replace this, um, and I. You know, I, I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the replacement for hot wars, this psychological info war, um, a blend of pandemics, maybe internet pandemics coming soon. But I think what we're going to have is a decade of, of brand new um, modern warfare that none of us have ever seen, that has, that, that has never really existed before. Um, and I think we are the test bed. Mm-hmm. This test bed, this this sort of political theories, it brings up sort of this notion of uh, that you've you've kind of uh, touched on this authoritarianism is sort of a a, a field of study or, or you know academia. It's very interesting. Uh, and before we jump into that, I, I really want to like figure out a little bit more of what's at stake. So it, it seems like this the centralized banking empire has has steered their empire around fiat, around the, the U.S. dollar as the world reserve. Um, currency. And, and it, it seems like they, they got a, uh, and I agree with you on everything about the controlled demolition. I, I, I see it as a little bit of the controlled demolition of the United States in terms of living standards so that they could bring uh, the first world down instead of ri- raising the living standards of the, of the third world. Um, but so where is uh, the ball moving to next? What, and what is at stake um, in terms of hegemony going forward? Uh, what would be the prize uh, in in the reset, or some yeah, of the so prizes? It, it's like a layman, as a normal person, you, we we don't see a lot. I mean, we can see uh, these these uh, these these governance steering committees. You see, like the Club of Rome. You see the Bilderberg meetings. Uh, you can see the World Economic Forum. You know who's in there. You know it's the the leaders of every powerful nation on earth. You know it's the top the heads of, of the, the biggest multinational corporations on earth, you know, it's the, the old banking families that sit behind the monopoly on money. So, um, and, and then we see the materials they put out and they basically have a, a, a story they want to tell um, uh, about the great reset and, and they want to create a bunch of, a bunch of um, growth industry and, and reset, you know, click you know wipe away all the old norms and create a new society and now's the time to do it because um you know we're at peak malleability. um the west really you know it's it's the, the west can no longer sustain itself the world monetary system is collapsing we're in it and so yeah now's a great time to say what's next <laughs> you know um and, 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 but that really is just the tip of the iceberg of course we don't see any anything going on um in the in the, the making of those materials Right. You, you don't have something like the Great Reset show up all of a sudden without lots of involvement from stakeholders who have been working over years against concerns. And, and I believe those concerns are coming in the form of various political theories. Um, and, and, and so like one is um, like um, Malthus, Malthus, Thomas Malthus um, was popular, um, very popular around the formation of the UN and the World Bank and the IMF and uh, the BIS and ESGs and SDRs. He he started like um like a neo-Malthusian movement started, which is to say, just 
a new group of, of uh, folks minded towards global governance that, that, that were very keen on what Malthus was saying. Mal Malthus predicted that um, the population would rise exponentially. So, you know, if each family had like um, two, three, four kids, um, that you would end up with this steep hockey curve. And the reason that that was happening is because living, living conditions improve. So people could have more kids. Um, that's, that's the basic thesis. And, but the problem would be is that um, the nature and Earth's ability to feed us doesn't grow exponentially. It grows linearly. So then you get this, um, this uh, uh, straight line from bottom left of a chart to the top right that represents uh, food growth. And then you have this hockey stick for population that far overshoots uh, food supply. And eventually you'll have a terrible correction in terms of population, um, chaos, famine. Um, Malthus predicted uh, 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 pandemics, he predicted war, all because you would have far more people on earth, this explosion of population that far exceeded um, the earth's carrying capacity. Um, so I, I think this is one of the fundamental political theories that um, have made its way into sort of central banking culture you, and thinking. Do you think that theory, uh, do you think Malthus theories uh, hold water? Um, um, it, yeah, uh, no, no, I don't. I, right. Honestly, I can't decide if Malthus is just a manufactured uh, mm -hmm. propagandist in the same way that like, uh, like a Fauci or a Marx or even right. like a James Mannard Keynes. Um, I can't decide if, you know, what came first? Did the agenda come first or right. did the political theory come first? That, that's very interesting in terms of priming. You know, I can't wrap my head around this. Uh, 1932, Huxley pub publishes Brave New World. And this is from your yeah. tweet. 12 years later, yeah. his brother Julian uh, produces the charter for the UN. And he was a, <laughs> a student of eugenics and globalism. And, you know, I don't know if I came across this through your feed or somewhere else, but you have Freud and then you have Freud's nephew, Ed Edward Bernays who's the father of propaganda, and his uh, nephew is uh, Mark Randolph, the, C the first CEO of Netflix. Um, and, and I kind of see Netflix as a direct arm of the state at this point and a propaganda outlet um, in, in just a, a lot of ways. And what do you make of this? I mean, I don't know if it's priming. I don't know if it's ac accidental leakage here. Um, what would they gain from, like, priming us with the dystopian of a brave new world and then rolling it out 60 years later. Is it a blueprint for their uh, heirs of this um, monopoly of, of credit creation? Uh, I just, I, how can you even extend sort of um, this sort of academia over generations it is sort of beyond me as well. Well, I think, I think it's a common grift. I mean, you know, the, you know, the science is, is very, you know, scientism is very old, I think. Um, mm. it, it, it's not new knowledge, the ability to lie with statistics, the ability to forge experts so that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, um, this is old statecraft. It's, it's your, your engineering consent for uh, various agendas. And so, um, you know, if you want, you know, for example, let's say you wanted to roll up the West into a single supranation, um, you know, you would need to convince uh, the, the, the governors of those states, you know, the actual statesmen, uh, whether they're the, the presidents or what have you, the very uh, stakeholders that are, that are decision makers, you would need to convince them that that is good for them long term. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think it, it's, you know, a well-known psychological fact that the best way to, to coerce uh, a, a human is with fear. Um, so if, if you can come up with like an extinction event and you could tell statesmen that we're hurtling towards this end of the world event, unless we do X, Y, or Z, um, I think that that's a good, uh, uh, you know, it's a good way to do it. So if you, you know, if you are, uh, running the, the multi-century, um, uh, family monopoly, uh, or cartel, I should say of central banking and, and your goals is to consolidate operations to, to streamline and upgrade your ability to steer society, then you need a very good um, uh, 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 emphasis, a very good tale to convince uh, those folks that, that would have to cede 
autonomy to you. Um, and so I, I think it's a blend of what's happening. I think um, maybe half of it is countries are so in debt up to their eyeballs mm. that you could attach credit creation to anything and they would follow at this point. Um, so they're absolutely addicted to money creation and, and, and that's kind of a deal with the devil. And I think, um, you can make countries do all sorts of stuff and, and us citizens down here on ground floor, you know, it, 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 well, let me put it this way. I think the West is so committed to creating this new form of government that there's not a single bombshell that's going to change that. There's not going to be some huge COVID bombshell and suddenly they all stop following this agenda. So I think in part, there's a debt sl slavery component. Um, the other part I think is there's a fear component. So if you, you know, convincing um, the world uh, that maybe, you know, maybe there really is a, 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 a Malthusian catastrophe around the corner and pop, you know, uh, you know, un, unseen level, you know, levels of poverty and war and, and, and um, uh, foodlessness that we've never seen before. Now, I, I actually don't think that that's true. Um, I think uh, Malthus, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's suspiciously um, it didn't account for human uh, intuition, innovation, mm -hmm. any, any accounts for change in technology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he also assumed that we that our, um, our, that our ability to like make decisions about having a family, it wouldn't change by lifestyle, like the natural constraints of the world that somehow we weren't making any decisions in the face of those constraints. And so, um, yeah, I, I think Malthus was, was wrong, but not in like a little innocent way. Like I think in a large um, uh, suspicious way, he was wrong. Um, in, in the same, in the to the same uh, order of magnitude that all the vaccine experts appear to be wrong right now, um, there's something just glaring about that that makes it feel like that is prop that is propaganda intellectualism. Um, and, but but nevertheless, I mean, even if you pen the terms for credit creation for every nation state on earth, you, you know. You can't really like you need a way to sell consolidating, leaving the nation state behind. Um, if that's your aim is to sort of consolidate into a handful of super nations on Earth, maybe a Western social scoring technocracy and an Eastern social scoring technocracy. So, you know, why would all these bureaucrats do it? And then how would they do it? How would they even sell it to their own people? And so I think you have a multi layered a multi-layered grift. The first layer is you could terrify statesmen themselves with an end of end of world um, political theory, and then those statesmen, believing that they were acting in their nation's best favor, would help generate the second order political grifts that are fed to the population as propaganda. So when I talk about Malthusian fear spells, I'm actually talking about those second order grifts uh, that we're fed because they're more politically acceptable. Things like climate change, things like um, uh, terrorism, things like, um, uh, 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 you know, so there's all these multi-nation problems that none of us can solve independently. And the only thing we can do is, you know, demand that these nations work together and wipe previous norms so that they can keep us safe from these global problems, the global problem of pandemics, the global problem of climate change, the global problem of you know, racism, the global problem of cyber terrorism. So you know, I, th I think it's this multi-tiered um, political theory grift um, be because it, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think you can say that the world is a monolith, it's not. You know, there are factions, there are governments, there are different mm -hmm. groups of people who have different in, uh, uh, things that they want. Um, so, uh, you know, but everyone is, no one is immune from incentives. The greatest incentive on earth is credit creation. Um, that and narrative. Um, and, and so I think, you know, building, you know, now you hear about narrative all the time. It's in the, in the political dialect, but I think narrative is as old as government. Um, uh, narrative, credit creation, um, and I think that those are the two primary tools. And and I think the aim is, um, well, to put it frankly, I think I think that um, after World War II, um, uh, fascist academia was rolled into communist academia, um, mm -hmm. and they went into China to develop this this hybrid, this new form 
of high tech totalitarianism. And now they have a good feel for it. You see it in the mega cities in China. Um, it's this kind of this social scoring communism in the front where everyone is sort of surveilled and has social scores. Um, and, and that determines their permissions in society. That's what like 99% of the people in China are, uh, are targeted for that system. And then in the back for the 1%, the elite, you have this kind of high tech totali- uh, this high tech fascism, excuse me, where the best companies are co-opted by the state and help run the, the whole thing. And, and you know, you, you could look, that, look at that and say like, oh wow, okay, so from fascist academia, they learned that um, a, a really good way to go is for the state to co-op companies. Because when in the Soviet Union, when the state tried to take over all industry, you know, it just led to famine and collapse. So, so that didn't work. Um, but in, in communist academia, they learned the importance of sort of um, these psychological narratives that kept people enslaved. They learned the importance of, of um, building a society that essentially socially scores you based on compliance. Um, and I think those um, were folded into the next gen development of governance primitives that and and so you know in 1971 uh uh, china was added to the un um uh you saw kissinger out meeting mao um uh nixon took the united states off the gold standard um china was sort of launches world economic forum yep schwab launches the world economic forum schwab's son is um out uh you know uh, 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 it closely related to the CCP, sort of operating the globalist outfit there. Um, they raised China up as this mega power in the world, um, anticipating the end of, of this long cycle, anticipating the end of this empire cycle, it's a 250 year cycle. Um, I think there's even some bigger cycles um, that are ending at the same time, but it's this convergence, this, this um, this, this sort of like geometric um, opportunity zone where they're kind of acting in um, that that they would say, okay, let's let's pitch to these states um, a, a plan for reset, and it's going to be something like, look, the 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 U.S. empire that kind of era is done, right? Every this whole monetary system is so interconnected that it's all going to come down at once. No one can insulate themselves from it. We have this this Malthusian catastrophe around the corner. So we all have this population problem. And furthermore, there's a jobs crisis. It's another political theory that I actually think has um, has has a certain amount of weight to it. Um, right. with te- technology is exploding in terms of the rate of the rate of advancement in technology is is exponential. And technology is owned and, and built by a tiny percentage of the world. And um, that's having the effect of displacing most of the workforce on earth. Um, so you, you also have this, this political current of 99% of the world. Uh, there's no great story for what they're going to do for jobs, um, you know, going into the next hundred years. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think like if I was, steering the world in terms of like what are the big narratives that governments need to care about you have a really strong uniting narrative because all governments are technically uh, have to deal with that same problem they have the problem of oh geez population problem you know population catastrophe oh geez job c- catastrophe right oh geez uh tech is leaving everyone behind um oh geez look how fast China's moving in terms of high-tech governance, we don't want to be left behind, right? And so to my eye, the, the Great Reset appears to be, um, you know, the World Economic Forum is just a club. It's not, it's not Schwab doing this to the world, right? The world is there working out the agenda and plan with him, with their concerns, their political problems. Mm-hmm. So it's really our governments doing it to us um, that's just the meeting place and the distribution center for, for the narrative for the average person. But to, to my eye, it's something like, um, in order to meet the, the political dilemmas of our time, in order to stay competitive with high tech governance systems like China is racing on, which will improve exponentially, give them exponentially more control over their people at a, at a, 
tighter and tighter costs. It'll be leaner and leaner and more efficient. In order for the West to stay competitive, we're going to roll the West up into a social scoring technocracy in the likeness of China, um, knowing that the US is going to lose dollar hegemony, knowing the US is going to lose global dominance. We're gonna roll the West up, consolidate it, um, and, and, and launch this, this uh, new form of government that looks a lot like what China has, but it'll be branded for the West. It'll be branded in social justice. It'll be branded, you know, it'll, it'll be, the, the, the rationale for why we're making these incredible changes will be to solve these Malthusian problems. It'll be to solve for pandemic justice, to solve for climate justice, to solve for racial justice, to solve for inequality to solve for cyber terrorism. And that'll be the explanation why the West is consolidating being rolled up in the likeness of China. But on, on the back end, the statesmen, I think they believe that they're saving the world. <laughs> I think they believe that like it's this or utter catastrophe for, for the West. Like the nation state is kind of dying. Um, uh, China's gonna leave us in the dust. Um, you know, you, you have Trump and Brexit sort of showing that um, the, you have these headwinds of nationalism as people are pushing back against globalism, uh, EU's in complete ruin, right? So they need, they know they need to make massive moves here to try and keep a foot with where, where everything's going. And so to my eye, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing our own government colluding on a plan to um, upgrade the governance model at the expense of natural rights, at the expense of all previous a uh, precedent. Um, you could almost say they're upgrading the legal system to be a, a, a software system um, and replacing uh, law and, and, and the judiciary system altogether with the type of high tech social scoring system you have in China. Because yeah. think about it in China, um, the CCP and, and the central banks there can draft policy and then program it directly into the social scoring algorithm. So they don't need to, to propagate it through layers of government. Uh, and so they, it's not lossy. It, it, it retains its full signal directly from the government and, and at far fewer people. And in, in, in the, the, effect, like the effectiveness of that is an order of magnitude greater than whatever has been achieved before. So from the government's point of view, you know, this kind of solves the issue of how do we sculpt behavior in the way we're going to need to be able to, to overcome these Malthusian catastrophes, this job catastrophe, how can we distribute resources? How could we ensure that when the nation, when the nanny state sort of is um, replaced by whatever's coming in terms of technology or new forms of governance, how can we make sure that we have a story for the 99% um, and that we don't end up in total um, you know, actual war, <laughs> actual war. I think they'd rather a manufactured war um, because they're, they're, they're scared of actual, actually, like an actual collapse that's uncontrolled. And, and that's my best take right now at what we're living through. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot there. In terms of what we're living through, it's like, I think you've noted like we're probably two years into World War III. This is an information war, uh, fake war, but, but real measures. And, you know, <laughs> it, contrasting it to a hot war, I mean, psychological warfare is brutal as well. Uh, I'm not trying to compare and contrast, actually. It's just, it's another brut brutal form of warfare. And what I also heard there, though, is the two greatest incentives in the world are, are, are narratives and credit creation. And it seems like with uh, reset, it, it seems like we're already seeding um, CBDCs to China in a lot of ways, Africa to China, the Middle East to China. And, and what I wonder there, though, is this, this upgrade of warfare, um, which we haven't touched on too much, but this is this, this, this scaling the state where what it sounds like a small group of programmers can control everyone. Um, it, you know, it, how critical a juncture in history is this? Is this the last long cycle? Um, are, are we facing the elimination of free will? Yeah, so, you know, to a certain extent, I, I, I believe that um, the state doesn't view these, view the boom bust cycles as ideal, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. to, to a certain extent, I think if it had a way that it could actually um, smooth those out, it would. 
Um, and, and of course, uh, the answer from the state's point of view is going to be extending central powers beyond belief, right? You know, to, a, to an extent never seen before. That's going to be their solution, more of the same, an extreme degree of central planning control. Um, and, and, and in a sense, you can see that with CBDCs, the fact that they could actually make um, a, a native um, dynamic um, uh, 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 negative interest rates. They can make money that, that has to be spent in a certain way so they can actually um, shape shape inflation across the the products the the product uh uh, uh service um uh gradient so they can actually shape it in a finite way and, and um they could they could uh, uh move preferences of society away from one set of assets into a new set of assets a new set of products you know for example you could phase out fossil fuels very effectively if you could control if you could program people's money um and and so uh, I, you know, I, I think, um, I, I think from, from their point of view, like you might even be able to eliminate the, the business cycle. You might even be able to eliminate the, 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 the long cycle, the large, the, you know, the, the sovereign nation state debt cycle. And because part, part of the reason these cycles exist is, so we have a, a two tier monetary system. Um, you have a, a wholesale circuit where central banks exist and commercial banks exist. And um, and, and a very small percentage of sort of like high-tech fascist companies are, you know, hedge funds are also privy to that circuit. Um, it's like the privilege circuit of the monetary system. Then we have a retail circuit. I um, mean, that's where we all exist. Most companies exist. Um, and, and, and so money is created in both circuits. It's created by central banks. It's lent to uh, commercial banks, but commercial banks also create money when they lend. Um, and, and, and so to a certain degree, that two circuit system does not afford them enough controls. They don't have enough controls. And so you could argue from like a Keynesian economics point of view that that is why they're cycles. Because if only we had huge amounts of controls to do um, uh, d dynamic reverse uh, uh, interest rates to, to basically price money more specifically, well, then the Keynesian sort of utopia could be achieved, this absolute perfect balance between um, what mankind needs, its desires, and, and you know, having a, a balance with nature. Because that's kind of the idea is that, we, you know, somehow through algorithms, we're going to be able to account for human action. We're going to be able to sculpt human action and we're going to have perfect homeostasis on Earth. And and I think, um, you know, if I was the the, the government uh, and, and I was looking at that system, of course, I'd be salivating at all these, you know, how much programmatic control I would have over the economy um, when you merge those two circuits of the monetary system into a single um, uh, software platform. Because that's what we're talking about. So, um, yes, I th I do think the state uh, believes that it could end, like that this would be the last cycle, um, and it would need uh, that 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 high level of totalitarian control to do so. Um, and and in regards to like free will, I think there's a good argument for for saying that they're you know they're ceding. Well, I, I think our statesmen are ceding the autonomy of nation states as we speak. I think part of what's going on is that um, the nation states are losing free will first, and they're losing it through all these um, the, the 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 mechanisms of reset. And so, in this case, at the at the nation state level, I think um, nation states are acquiring uh, vaccines through the IMF's SDR mechanism. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the way that they're becoming this, this sort of permanent debt slave. And, and, and I think there's a trade of sovereign assets and sovereign autonomy within there that we don't see hidden behind contracts. Um, but I think that the nation state itself is actually losing um, its own free will through that. Um, I think multinational corporations who have become addicted to cheap money um, are getting aboard this ESG game. So mm -hmm. they have these ESG loans and they're essentially signing up for global governance through the veal of green, you know, environmentalism. Um, and individuals themselves, how many people on earth was glad when 2020 started that they were able to pause everything, go home, start, you know, they're getting bailed out with uh, UBI of this form or not. So I think even individuals have sort of 
um, done the deal with the devil, and they're also seeding their own autonomy by way of addiction to credit creation. Um, so, I, so I do think that um, that that's kind of the trend is like they can attach credit creation at each layer of society, and and most of society will follow, even if it means trading autonomy and free will. Um, you know. Like, I think to better answer that question, just look at where China is, because they really are out in front in terms of high tech mm-hmm. government. Their aim is autonomous governance in the same way that like Waymo wants to build an autonomous car. They want a AI central planner that um, that 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 they feed um, inputs of every product, service and human action. Uh, by way of surveillance, they feed it as an input to this AI central planner and the output is the adjustments they make to the incentive system so that they get, um, and, and so it's, it's, that's what China's after, it's autonomous governance. It's governance that runs itself. They just describe uh, the state that they wish to have and then the, the governance system converges on that by controlling everyone's behavior. Um, and in China, the the, like in, in the cities that have this rolled out, it's fairly rapid. It, it basically displaces the legal system. Uh, the government gets very lean. You don't need much of a boots on the ground presence because um, it's not so different than like the minority report. Um, everything you do, so you have a digital ID, they scan your face, you'll have the Cedric ID mm-hmm. and it's using biometrics you can't escape. So anywhere on earth, they can look you up. You'll never be able to escape it. That's why in minority report he actually like removes his eyes that's kind of like the, the you know he, he, to escape biometrics and that, a lot of these dystopian stories have that kind of element it's like um and, and so they have an id for you and you know they can look you up as you walk through space so as you walk through your neighborhood you go into stores they know all your actions they know what you're doing they know what you're buying um and then they can rate you based on that and say okay cedric your score is a 300 out of 350 this is how much access to society you get uh you know we're gonna help you succeed um and if you don't behave the way we like we'll push you down in society you'll get kind of forced out um so society will mold around you automatically based on your behavior until and and that's how they can get your uh get the desired behavior um now it's not just in physical space it's not just walking around it's also when you go online you know the the great firewall of china so when you go on the internet and you want to communicate with people and you want to see news um they can see what you think what you what you're accessing um and they can rate you based on that are you a political dissident are you are you um, a happy complier who's happy to stay in the bubble or are you waking up does that affect your score and and so that's that's the experience of living in china and this is new technology and I can tell you from working in software for a decade and a half that this really is just the start. Like it, it gets dark very fast with, with what tech can do. Um, it, it, to, to put it a, another way, so what communism tries to do is to um, create a perfectly balanced society, um, a utopia, uh, where everyone has what they need to survive and, and, people, and you eliminate all suffering and want. Um, and the problem with that is, is that um, you exhibit too much control over the actors and they lose their drive and ingenuity um, b- because you're, you're kind of chewing into the human spirit a little, right? You're saying, hey, you, have, you don't have enough autonomy. People become hopeless um, or, or they thrash out. Um, it, but, but I think what this high tech governance thing tries to do is say, well, what if we record human action well enough? What if we record your thoughts? What if we record every action you take, every behavior you take? What if we use AI models to come up with the type of person you are so that we can influence you in just the right way with a custom tailor-made um, uh, governance policy just for you? Because you know you are Cedric and you like to behave in this way in our city. And so let's, let's influence you so that we get the desired behavior. Um, you know, very quickly, you end up with a government that doesn't need a legal system, doesn't need a judiciary. The only thing you need to do is when um, people start behaving, um, like misbehaving, you just need like a couple of different types of punishment. Like you can reduce access to society, you can limit their mobility, you can shame them publicly so they become kind of like a public enemy, number one. Um, maybe they stop 
behaving, you could like pick them up and re-educate them. And if they really slide down to where it's unacceptable, you can throw them in like a concentration camp. So I think, you know, the Chinese system is kind of like this high tech governance. And then you have this human garbage disposal at the bottom end for people that um, that that don't fit in. And, and, and so, you know, I look in the last couple of years and I ask myself, is that kind of high tech governance system being imported to the West? And what I would expect to see is, um, is the digital identity stuff making its way into the West? Because that's the foundation. You need that. And Florida. I think, yeah. It's, that's happening in Florida. Yeah, it's happening in Florida for driver's license. Um, I think uh, Texas is talking about doing it for voting. Uh, the IRS just said they're going to take high fidelity biometrics uh, of your face in order to access your taxes. So, you know, um, various parts, you know, progressive and conservative are all getting on board with this idea that every citizen is going to be um, tagged with inescapable biometrics. And, and so you're going to have these databases um, uh, of, uh, of sort of human uh, uh, IDs that they could look up, you know, you won't need anything on your person to look you up. Um, airports have had them for a bit now, these high fidelity biometric services. So um, I, I think, yes, that base layer is showing up in the West. Um, why, you know, why is it showing up in the West? I think competition. I think the, the government's saying we don't want to get left behind in the analog era. We're going to, we're going to chase after these high tech governments. So we're going to pay out contractors to upgrade our systems and we're going to slowly lean into this stuff. So, yeah, I do think you're seeing the base layer, but then you, and, and that's not really that controversial because that doesn't change much if you don't think about it too much. Mm. Where it's controversial is the various pillars that replace what we think of as government. And, and this is where I think it starts getting a little, like slightly scary because um, in China, they have movement passports, right? Mm -hmm. So your faith is your movement passport and there are gates everywhere you go that determine if you have permission to enter this store, this neighborhood, this train. Um, and, if, and if you don't behave, the, the, the city just transforms itself to, to allow you to enter here or not allow you to enter there. Um, and, and, and of course, that idea would not be politically feasible in the West because we have freedom of movement. Um, but alas, uh, you know, we've had a mm. big global pandemic and now, um, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the shared, the collective space is no longer safe. So we have to wipe that norm away and we have to create this new normal where um, we are showing like passports to move around. And, and by default, you know, the kind of right to move is gonna fade away. And, and so, okay, that's the first, maybe the most controversial pillar and um, mm. I know with Omicron kind of fell flat and the fear level fell below probably what they needed to be. So it seems like they put that on the back burner. But now that there's sort of fear mongering of war with Russia, you know, the, the truth is now that lockdowns and movement passports are a policy tool, mm -hmm. they just need to, um, you know, it, it would only take a like a bioterrorism event um, in order they would just immediately turn to that society would. So um, that's a pretty good place to be in if you're trying to, to, to create that uh, pillar within society that, move, you know, that, that, that the movement passports, um, you know, you could, you, you could blame something on Russia. It, you know, it doesn't even have to be real. You could just falsify it in media, right? Um, and, and so it's, it's a pretty advantageous place. You know, we're all sitting in our homes staring at social media you don't know if there was a, a, a smallpox, a you don't know, right? And, and But suddenly you're in lockdown again, right? Oh, and here comes the vaccine passports again, or the movement passports. So, so I think they'll circle back to movement passports because it's part of upgrading the West in the likeness of this high-tech totalitarianism. Um, so that pillar, I think we are seeing it. And, it, mm -hmm. you know, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, we'll never see that in the West. You'll never see movement passports. But uh, they, they were able to start normalizing it. It's a policy yeah. tool. It's a policy yeah. tool that they can use at will. Um, so, so I think uh, that's happening. Um, yeah. You also need, yeah, jump no, on it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, I mean, ever since 9-11, you've seen the TSFication of, of America. And uh, you've stated this 9-11, we got movement licenses between countries. 
Right. And, and you now in 2020 and 2021, we're getting movement in your neighborhood <laughs> in your neighborhood. And it's, it's one of the, it's the reason, uh, the final store for, uh, I'm leaving Chicago and, uh, you know, it's difficult to live through great reset. It sucks. And, um, you know, there was a lot though, that you mentioned there around, um, uh, social score. And, you yep. know, it makes me think about social score, uh, the way you kind of describe it is like you, the social score becomes your God or the algorithm. Yes. does. And the social score is just the result. And you've mentioned a lot of times that, you know, sort of the, the euphemism deal with the devil. And I wonder is credit creation, the root of all evil in, and I'm not talking about credit. I'm not talking about you. Someone has assets and they give you a loan against their assets in an, an equity fashion, but credit creation is that the root of all evil here? And what I'm really getting at is it seems like so much is at risk because what you're describing is is happening very rapidly. Two, three years ago, we would have been, uh, this conversation would have been laughed out of the room, um, but movement licensors are here. Uh, you know, you know the adage, uh, temporary, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. Um, yeah. You know, is this man versus nature that we're facing? Because uh, I, 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 I mean, to, to, to a certain degree, I mean, you wouldn't have this peak centralization of government overreach if the government didn't have an ability to conduct in, invisible 100%. taxation. It, it's invisible taxation through money printing. And, and, and you know, between that, uh, between money printing and, and technology, those both have strong centralizing tendencies. So you've centralized all the wealth and power in a tiny group of people on earth. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, the, 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 the money is created at the behest of, of a, a banking industry. You know, so it's, 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 a, it's the original fascist partnership is the state and money, um, force and money. So, um, you know, those have became this monster that, that um, you know, creates the type of issues that they want to solve with more of the same. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, it's, yeah, yeah, I do think, um, I, I, I do think we wouldn't be going through any of this if, if for some reason that um, monetary technology wasn't discovered. That, that's, mm. But at the same time, it's like, I think it led us to Bitcoin. So, you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, sulking over the fact that money, you know, I, I think it was monetary evolution that that uh, was necessary for us to realize that you can't have a small group of people have unlimited access to the world's life savings and not expect a totalitarianism to emerge. Of course, that result you give you give, you know, um, you give a tiny group, you know, on the order of less than probably 10,000 people, um, unlimited access to the world's wealth. Of course, of course, the result is, um, you, you know, we're going to have this brave new world totalitarianism because, um, you know, to a certain degree, we're a big sprawling species. And, and maybe from their point of view, we're, we've kind of spoiled the best parts of being the best mm. part of this gorgeous earth. So, like, you know, what else would be the prize if you had all the wealth already? The only prize would be restoring nature, clawing it back a little, letting it kind of recoup from the explosion of mankind. And, um, and, and so you would need a system like this to do it covertly. Um, Cause other words, you're going to have to do it the hard way and the hard way is nasty and probably doesn't give the results they want anyway. So yeah, it is, a, it is an um, absurd conversation that, that um, you know, you could never have before 2020. I mean, mm. I became glued to COVID cause I, I, I knew something much bigger was happening. And I, I started to zoom way out and look at it in terms of, well, is there a money aspect? And sure enough, I saw um, that we had kicked the can down the road in terms of uh, um, the small cycles and, and sort of uh, doing bailouts and blowing the bubble bigger and bigger. And, and then I realized in 2019, when the repo market started going crazy, did we just, you know, have we just entered, de are we defaulting? Are we living through default? And, and that's, and then I started seeing the World Economic Forum, which had all our, all our leaders in it, coming out with this pit for how they were going to upgrade society, right? And I started to think backwards, like, where did all this come from? I went deep into the origins of globalism and the political theories that were popular there and realized there was a very strong 
uh, Malthusian tendency, a eugenic tendency, population control tendency, a very strong um, uh, desire for sort of utopian balance with nature, um, it, 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 that communism had indeed came out of the same camp. Um, and, 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 and really, you know, democ Western democracy is kind of a soft, politically correct form of communism. It's, it's you have this um, pathological collectivism that controls, um, uh, that sort of lords over a small productive class. Um, and then we all have this song and dance that makes it feel like we're in control, but really um, it's just covert communism. I mean, at least in China, they have the balls to be overt about. At least in China, it's in your face and they're not telling you some story about why, you know, this is social justice. Um, so, so, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I do think it's, yeah, it's bleak, it's dark. You couldn't really have this conversation before, but it's important to domestify it and realize there is an industry of governance in the world. And most of it takes place behind closed doors. We see the part they've prepared for us and it involves operating large nation states, managing their balance sheets, managing people, um, in terms of line items on those balance sheets and, um, and thinking through, you know, um, to one degree, like the, the earth's carrying capacity is part of that equation in their eyes, right? So they're the, they're the governors of the monopoly on force and money. And, and, you know, it's a national security risk that we might have a, um, a, a, a Malthusian catastrophe, right? Um, I think the jobs thing is probably real. Like I don't, you know, before Bitcoin, I wouldn't have an answer for what you do with the jobs. Bitcoin's interesting because on a Bitcoin standard, everyone gets to retire because it reverses the centralization of wealth um, such that uh, no one can take, you know, so you could, you could have a very, you know, everyone doesn't have to be a programmer. You could, you could become a really good, like furniture maker. Um, you could produce value for the world. You save that value in Bitcoin and then you could retire, right? Like it, it reverses that gross centralization that actually disenfranchises the 99% in a way that um, you have a broad economy instead of a narrow economy, because that's what the, I mean, the great reset is like, they're rolling it up even tighter. No small businesses. Let's have only multinational mm -hmm. corporations. It's this narrow uh, totalitarian economy. Um, and, and Bitcoin reverses that. So swinging back to what I was saying before, we, we do see digital identity in the West. We are seeing movement passports being normalized in the West. Um, and, and so what I would expect next, the last two pillars, you need to see something around internet passports. That's mm -hmm. what they have in China, like a great firewall of the West instead of China. So, so I'm on the lookout for um, something that paves the way for that. And, you know, in July, 2020, just months after the pandemic, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that 24 seven hysteria loop began, um, the same guys, Davos, the world economic forum came out with a prediction about a cyber pandemic that we were going to have an internet pandemic that was so big, it would make COVID seem like a small nuisance. And so, yeah, I've been tracking it. And, and since then, um, you've had uh, Homeland Security say, um, you know, oh, we're on the precipice of a, of a, a cyber war. Uh, Biden saying uh, cyber war right around the corner. You have CISA, which is the, the government's um, cybersecurity defense saying cyber war uh, 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 imminent, Space Force cyber war imminent. Um, uh, uh, the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell saying um, uh, it all might collapse because of a cyber war. So the, the monetary system might collapse. It'll be a cyber war. Um, the Pentagon did a, uh, in 2018, they did a war gaming where they thought that uh, you'd have a Bitcoin, um, uh, a Bitcoin revolt from Zen, uh, Gen Zers mm. that would do a cyber war across the West and the collapse of the nation state. So um, every state, agency and actor that that would have any authority in the area is all sort of <laughs> including the steering the global steering community that that includes our our leaders they're all warning about a cyber pandemic and i started thinking like why why a cyber pandemic and i realized it's the same recipe that they use to roll out movement passports they can do for the internet with movement passports there was a you know a pandemic 
the, the, the collective space was no longer safe. They had to wipe out all previous norms, establish this passport system so that we could trust the, the collective space again. So the trust was wiped out by the pandemic, the trust in society. And I realized if you had a cyber, um, uh, uh, like a cyber false flag on the internet, the trust in the internet could be completely wiped out. And, and you, you would probably have internet lockdowns and then you would have internet passports so that we could trust the internet again because that's you know all those previous norms had to be wiped out because and who knows what it will be right is it mm -hmm. they they shut everything down for 36 hours and and that's enough to kick off a fear you know a, a hysteria fear loop that lasts for two years um is it just the banking systems uh, who knows i mean you know at the same time it could be nearly nothing they could just say it's happening so it, it's they need an event large enough that, that it will call, cause broad fear and they'll need to use the mainstream me media to create that 24 seven news coverage. And so I was looking for that and I saw through the, over the winter that like Omicron was falling flat. So I, I thought, you know, the last thing they can do is allow everyone to wake up from the hysteria. This whole decade, we need to be mired in hysteria. So I, I had a sense that they would pivot and, and sure enough, uh, uh, the, they started beating the war drum with Russia, you know, Russia, Russia, Russia. Now the whole West, we're going to war with Russia and they're all connecting cyber to Russia. So now the setup looks a little like, okay, false flag. You know, we attack ourselves with a cyber weapon. I know the CIA just bought Pentagon, uh, uh, just bought the, um, uh, I forgot that cyber weapon named at Pegasus. Mm -hmm. They just acquired Pegasus, which is a, uh, like a zero day platform for attacking computer networks. So, you know, who knows? I mean, it could be anything. It could be a legitimate attack. It could simply be a partnership across industries and they just flip the off switch, right? It could be really, you name it. It wouldn't be that hard to create the fear event. And the fear event doesn't have to be long. It would only have to be one big event, one day, two days. It's, you know, that would be enough that they could actually create that, that deafening 24 seven hysteria loop and like I said before, the, the war is not real. The measures are real. And that could lead to internet lockdowns and internet um, passports. And so that's kind of how I view it. You, you have the steering community, committee prophesizing, uh, 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 foreshadowing these, the, the, cyber, the actual pandemic before it happened. It happened and we got movement passports. Now they're foreshadowing an internet pandemic before it happened, and I suspect it'll happen and we'll get internet passports. Combined with digital identity, you have the basics for high-tech governance, a social scoring system, exactly like in China. All you need is the programming house that develops the social scoring algorithm that replaces the judiciary system. Right. Yeah, you tweeted out cyber pandemic hypothesis, number one, massive false flag hack. Number two, NATO triggers Article 5 for the second time ever. First was 9-11. Number three, Great Reset allies together against cyber terrorism. Number four, calls for digital identity, only internet. Number five, Great Wall, great Firewall of the West. And then in quotes, vaccinate the internet. Uh, it was a very interesting um, thought model there. Another one of your tweets was around um, terrorism equals pre-crime. Pre I thought that was a very fascinating way of looking at sort of uh, world dynamics. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm very interested about, uh, just as an anecdote, is whether, you know, when credit creation was discovered in the way the Bitcoin was, I wonder in the first 10 or 12 years, did they, the early um, followers of credit creation, did they know what they were on to very early on uh, in the way that, you know, 13 years into Bitcoin, uh, some of us are passionate about it and, and see the ways it can change the world. M my, my final question before we get into Bitcoin stuff is is around transhumanism and and yeah. you know whether you know that is i don't know whether like we're being experimented on psychologically and physically uh in this third war before this third war even is that another facet of this reset that we're going through yeah so in regards to like monetary science and the discovery of credit creation money printing um, synthetic money printing digital money printing um i do think that as we move past the gold standard and leaned into digital systems, I think they realized that uh, there was nothing 
nothing beyond the purchasing power of, of the citizens of the world, nothing beyond that to limit money printing. I mean, really, you, can imp- you could print the extent of everyone's purchasing power, right? Mm. And then you're broke. Um, so, 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 so I think that, um, if you're behind, you know, uh, uh, the state and, and central banking, I think that that wasn't lost on them. Um, I think as they played with it, they realized it exacerbated the, the cycles. So you got, you got bigger booms and, and, and harsher busts. Um, and, and to a certain degree, I, I think like these cycles suit them because, um, you, it gives you, you know, it's kind of the same thing we see with like uh, governments. They've kind of learned that like it's easier to lead in emergencies. Like they grant themselves autonomy to kind of to, 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 to bypass a bunch of systems. And I think the same thing is true with money printing. It's like um, you're, 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 you know, you're kind of constrained in good times, right? Uh, how much money you could print. Like, you know, if you, you don't want too much inflation to show in, in the essentials that people need. So um, you need a way to, like hide your money printing inside of growth. So as long as you have good, healthy growth stories, a lot of the money, a lot of like the time theft can be hidden. Um, and th- this whole monetary system requires growth. In other words, that's it. Um, there's, you know, cause in other words, it's just overt um, theft and, and, and uh, the system dies, right? So you have a, um, wealth is stolen and then that's it. There's, there's no more life to it. Um, you just have, you know, a small, tiny amount of people with all the things and, and now what? So they, they need to invest in growth stories. And I think um, I mentioned with war, how like war is kind of a, a, it's a balance sheet mechanism. It lets you like clean up your liabilities. It lets you um, do a good amount of surgery uh, on the balance sheet, but it also lets you like launch industry, like cent- central industry. So like World War II, like the processed food industry came out of World War II, cereals and canned food. And um, that, that was huge. Um, so like I, and, and, and they needed that because they knew part of managing like default back then was that you'd end up with famine and, and bread lines. So you need a way to actually launch um, the centralized uh, uh, food services when, when you have um, like societal collapse, because that, that's what, that's what war is hiding. It's hiding the fact that the monetary system's collapsed. Mm. Um, um, but it's also, you know, it's, you get record levels of money printing. So it's a great excuse too, because, oh, you're fighting a war. So now gloves off, they can, they can basically reach out and excavate as much capital as possible before there's, you can't grab anymore. So it's like a final fleecing before they reset everything. Mm. And you get this, this hyper concentration of wealth um, into insider hands. I um, mean, insiders, I mean, the people that print the money and the people that first receive the money and the Cantillon effect, right? So if you're in that club, um, if that was evenly distributed, you'd instantly just hyperinflate. Um, but because 99% of the world is on house arrest, it keeps that arbitrage window open. So the people getting all this new money can go scoop everything up. Um, it's really gross. Um, so I think in, in a way, like it suits, it suits them. Um, but I think we're to the point where assets already have been centralized. So they need to move on to <laughs> new frontiers. And, and so like, um, like what's left and, 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 and like what growth stories or what industries can you think of? Um, I, I think like the transhumanism uh, uh, areas, like an industry is attractive to, to the power brokers of the world. I mean, this idea that you could collapse all vaccines into a single mRNA duplex that you gave the, the human species regularly that opened the door to, I mean, so much, so much that opens the door to in terms of um, tinkering with genes, um, and, 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 and beyond like gene modification, like it's, it's, it's unfettered access by the state and all their partners to the bloodstream of the human species. So like, you know, use your imagination. It's like, that gives you the ability to, to precisely control populations across demographics. It gives you the ability to run covert experiments. It gives you, you know, and you can do the data collection all covertly, um, you could you could indemnify, you could incorporate um, the this industry into the state, so it actually becomes part of the government. Um, and there's lots of you know things that you could learn. Um, now, if if you are 
in the in the industry of governance of driving the human species, of course, there are things that you would want to do, i.e., eugenics and and what have you. So, um, like my, I don't I don't want to be too specific other than to say. Um, I do think part of what's happening is um, a transhumanism industry is being launched through COVID. Um, be, and, and, and that's why movement passports are being tied to vaccine passports, because, um, well, if you have, a, a, you know, the ambitions of a population control, that's useful, right? If there's if there's 99% of the world that's going to be um, uh, uh, displaced by uh, joblessness, by tech, and, and unable to feed themselves, so you're gonna be subsidizing them. Um, it's useful to have access to everyone's um, veins. Um, you know, what percentage of the world is necessary to actually do transhumanism, to make progress with transhumanism? I don't know. Is it 5 billion, 10 billion? How much do you need to actually evolve the human species uh, in a way that's safe for the 1% or for the insiders to benefit from? I don't know. Um, I, but but I do know that like if you look at just that is a frontier that we've never gone we've never we've never we've never granted ourselves unlimited access to human experimentation across eight billion people. Um, so I you know I, I I do think it'd be naive not to imagine there was excitement around that um, and that the, the government was granting this sort of ability to go where we've never gone before um, and that the the inside elite that that held all the wealth in the world, I was excited about that. I think, of course they are, of course they are. Um, I, I think you're gonna, like, there's another, there, there also seems to be a push for like more, like the next generation of centralized food services. You see like Bill Gates buying all the farmland. Um, you, you, so I think they wanna push food tech to that next gen where it has a minimal impact on nature, but it also is like engineered food if that makes sense, right. maybe even, maybe even of, of no natural origin, you know, grown meat, et cetera. Um, so I think, I think that's another growth story. Um, I think tech is not going anywhere. I think, um, well, to a certain degree, the, the privatization of, of autonomous governance um, in, in a weird way, I think the government themselves are leaning into the sovereign individual thesis, like they're privatizing their own operation. Um, so I think that's another industry. Um, and you need these stories. You need these growth stories. Space it seems to be another industry. Um, you need these if, if you're going to extend the fiat experiment, right? Because when you've disenfranchised the whole world by centralizing everything, you can no longer rely on just the free market to do its thing and people to solve their own problems. So you need to birth industry. Um, sometimes you get lucky. There's enough, you know, China has a good has seemed to found good balance between allowing a pseudo free market to find gems in, in terms of industry and experiments and businesses, raising them up and then co-opting them. And so, um, I, but, but I, but, but I do suspect that, um, like transhumanism is a big part of what's going on here, especially if, 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 if the state believes that uh, that we might have a Malthusian crisis around the corner if the state truly believes there's a joblessness um, issue, uh, uh, if the state believes the um, the junk on on climate change. Right. I, I'm not convinced they do. I think climate change might just be the domestified version for our consumption. Yeah, it's looking more and more like that. You know, you mentioned the war. You know, uh, excited. Uh, I, I'm excited about Bitcoin. I think you are too. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, as the, sh the state shifts from the nation state, maybe to uh, some sort of global entity, uh, I, I think what we're getting at is that, that the individual is, sh is shifting from the state to the sovereign individual. And I think yeah. Bitcoin is a huge tool in, in that sort of toolkit. What, what does it mean to you to be a Bitcoin citizen? Yeah, so a Bitcoin citizen is when you essentially don't count yourself as as part of a nation state uh, certainly you don't count yourself as a subject of a nation state anymore and the way that you've sort of gotten yourself close to that is by uh slowly engineering away uh, any attachments uh, any strings attached and so in my case um i don't i don't use i, I don't hold any fiat i haven't had a, a penny in in months um i live on bitcoin um i, I i'm very close to not having a retirement agreement with with the, the government so 
um, I will fully be in Bitcoin. Um, and, and the idea is, is that, um, I mean, the guidance that I've given folks is to, you know, move down the risk gradient and become expensive to tyranny. Um, in other words, the, the nanny state really is dying. They're going to they're gonna try and get someone to pay for it. They're going to try and make these wild changes to the population centers in a, in a sort of a Hail Mary to try and uh, uh, extend this fiat experiment, which is clearly dying. Um, and so what, you, you know, what, what I think folks should do is like, don't be in the city, <laughs> first of all. Um, it's very um, cost effective to, to do these things in population centers. When you go out of a population center, the cost of reaching you just gets absorbent in it. So it's a very simple thing. You could raise the cost of tyranny just by not being where they plan on rolling out this great reset. Like COVID is, was a very good uh, uh, signal. It's like a good proxy for freedom. If you were surrounded in an area with lockdowns and everyone's going berserk with COVID, it's a good indication that those people are going to be highly susceptible to the changes of the great reset that they will just fall in line with, you know, with internet lockdowns on and on all the measures. So if you found yourself in a place where, you know, if you weren't on your phone, you wouldn't know COVID was going on. That's a good, that's a good place to start. Um, because, uh, you know, I think physically that makes you expensive to tyranny in, in the sense that why would they focus on you? They, they have the 99% they can focus on in the population centers and that's what they'll do. And, but, it's not just where you are, it's also digitally, right? I, I do see um, increasing, you know, I don't think it's boots on the ground. I think most of this is info war. Most of this is um, in cyberspace. It's mostly in the tech platform. So, you know, if they launch like government login, internet passport, so you're logging into your computer with your government ID, you're logging into Facebook or Twitter, you're logging into Gmail with your government ID and they're associating all that info to you so they could score you based on it, you know, so you get, uh, you get uh, uh, profiled online, but persecuted in real life, right, because of what you do online. Um, that's all going to hit these main big platforms first. And so like, uh, I, I, I've moved off of like, um, Windows and, and Apple and I use like Linux for, on my desktop and it's really nice. It's actually quite easy and it's came a long way in the last decade. And it feels like where Mac and Linux were just a couple of years ago. And like, I have a nice assurance that that's extremely expensive to bring government login to Linux because it's an open distributed uh, 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 system that, that is, it doesn't have a central source of authority. It's just open code available on the internet. Um, I use a little ISP. I'm not using AT&T because I don't want to be uh, the first one being forced to use government login, right? For ISP, um, I don't use Gmail. I've, I've, I've gone off, I've gone to Proton Mail. So it's like privacy, it's like encrypted email. It's not necessarily safe because all email travels over the internet backbone and gets vacuumed up by the NSA. But at the same time, the emails are, are encrypted at rest so that that actual provider can't build a bunch of features around it. And they're privacy minded. So I could see them resisting you know, a little bit, not being the first one to launch government login. I think you'll see Gmail jump on that. I think they'll be thrilled. Um, uh, I've set up uh, little communities in uh, Matrix. Matrix is like a, it's like an open source encrypted uh, chat platform, like a Telegram. Um, so, you know, you kind of get your friends, your little communities set up away from big tech. And so, um, you know, I voted with my feet physically and digitally. I've made myself sort of opted out, pre-opted out of movement passports and internet passports. And so um, what does that do? I mean, that buys me time. That buys me time to sit back and observe the nation state dying, uh, sit back and observe this, in, this hypertrophied uh, uh, nanny state that is going to try and, it, it'll basically be in death throes. It'll, it'll attempt to confiscate any remaining wealth and productivity um, and try and get that tiny little sliver of productive wealth holders to bail out the nation state. I mean, that, that's what's coming. That's what this is. And so, um, you know, where I want to be and where I want other Bitcoiners to be is like, have your time in Bitcoin where it can't be confiscated, right? Where you have a cryptographic guarantee um, that it would be far more expensive to take your wealth right? 
than 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 to simply contribute to, to Bitcoin's success. Okay, that's a good start. So now your monetary energy is way down the risk gradient. Awesome. Physically, move down the risk gradient. Great. Um, uh, digitally, move down the risk gradient. Great. Lean into localism. There's, um, you know, find find your your regenerative ranchers in your area who who manage their own input, so they don't even import, they don't even buy inputs. They just do it all on that one place and network with those people. And and um, that lets you observe. That lets you observe without getting sucked into this machine that they're erecting. And it lets you stay a neutral person. You don't have to react. You'll be able to act. And that's extremely important as we shift from the twilight of democracy, the, you know, the end of the nation state into an era of the sovereign individual. Now, what I expect to see is that this decade, we will have a dozen free private cities launch. Mm. And a free private city is like, um, it's a, it's a, a tiny sovereign that you can negotiate a private treaty, a private contract with for residents. So it's, you can think of it as a company that provides government services. Um, so you can go live there on property there. You pre-negotiate the terms. So maybe it's an annual tax. Switzerland's kind of like that. Um, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's um, a, a revenue share, whatever it is. Maybe it's a flat payment. Um, and then you have, and, and they provide kind of the things you expect. Like they work with the, the pri- private um, companies to provide um, uh, 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 infrastructure, roads, defense, these type of things. And, and I know that um, I know that there's a handful in, in the world right now. Uh, it's a very brand new concept. Um, but this was theorized by the sovereign individual, this idea that eventually the most productive people on earth are, are, are going to be done carrying the entire weight of this top heavy nanny state. And they're going to go to these really slim um, sovereign cities brand new sovereign cities. And that form of governance will catch on because even the Great Reset is two-tiered. Even the Great Reset has the bottom tier, 99%, the surf tier that they're, that they're taking care of. And then it has the moneyed tier, the 1% above. So even they will be attracted to holding Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. They will be attracted to sovereign cities. That's what I meant before when I say, in, in a weird way, no one's immune from the game theory of, of this mega political shift between peak centralization and peak decentralization. Um, if you have money and, and, and you're not a serf, you can't insulate yourself from Bitcoin. So, so even these great reset uh, elite will find themselves wanting to protect their wealth with Bitcoin. Um, even they will find themselves wanting to live in the, the really um, luxurious and brand new sovereign city uh, uh, model. So I think this decade will have dozens, and I think next decade will have thousands of, of free private cities. Um, and the, the productive class of the world will essentially abandon the the nanny state in, in as it's as it's uh, you know sort of going through like a slow collapse. Um, and, and so what I want to do and what I want Bitcoiners to do is to position themselves to be able to watch those free private cities come online so that you can shop them. <laughs> um, and, mm-hmm. and I don't know the shape of how this will take. I mean, yeah. the, to a certain degree, like there might be like a balkanization headwind within the U.S. even where you have like Texas and Florida and Arizona say we're Bitcoin states like, you know, you want to be in a place that you can you know, we can't fight all these waves, but we can learn to surf. So you want to be in a place Mm -hmm. that you position yourself for sovereignty because a large percentage of the world they're trying to capture in this high-tech totalitarianism. And so I think it's as simple as that. It's, you you don't want to be in a place where you're panicking. You want to be able to watch the sovereign individual era come online, have your pick, uh, you know, of of the various brochures and the various new cities and, and sort of, um, you know, we're going to be like the people that came to the United States uh, hoping for a better future for their families and, and for the next you know era. That's what's about to happen for uh, Bitcoiners. Yeah, that's awesome. And what I also love is, I mean, that was a lot about how to, you know, maybe be a Bitcoin citizen in the physical world. But uh, what has it been like for you being a Bitcoin citizen, Bitcoin citizen in, in I'm going to call it the metaverse? Uh, and let's call it the decentralized metaverse the way you're doing it. Uh, yeah. 
you're you're, invo- you're engaging in voluntary commerce, um, building um, a portfolio based on your reputation and skills, which with 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 you, with, with this profile and that that you been going on is very different maybe from your your private personal life where you've had your career and, and you have your other set of skills or maybe it's, well, it's the same set of skills but you know get employed in different ways when you were working um what has it been like to be a bitcoin citizen in in, in the metaverse well i, I think <clears throat> certainly it's it's liberating i mean when you when you create a a a identity a reputation online that's not tied to your legal or your physical person um, it gives you a blank slate that you can really um, explore ideas without the same type of consequences you have in small communities in the physical space. And, and, and so I think liberating certainly uh, captures it. Um, it. It's so nascent, though. I mean, a lot of people, mm. the human Are you element, living in the future? You yeah, feel like well, you- I, I mean, in the sense that I've had to figure out how to create communities and friendships without exposing my real person. And, and, mm. and, and that uh, made me very introspective because I, I too had that human feeling. It's like, I want to uh, shake this person's hand and, 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 you know, and, and, and know them uh, in person. And so there's something very interesting about that, but uh, I think it's compelling this idea that you could live anywhere in the world and in a soft, you know, a free private city and then work anywhere in the world. Um, you could, provide your services for Bitcoin. And so I want to be a part of that. And, and so um, that's part of the reason why. Also, you know, when you're talking about like the, the mega political um, uh, uh, shift between the, the era of the state and the era of, um, of the, the, the individual, I think there's political risk there, you know, just to talk about things plainly. I just um, also, you know, this has absorbed my attention since 2020, but it's not who, you know, who I am. I, mm. I'm just a regular, you know, the software uh, engineer kind of minded person. I, and, you know, I don't spend all my time doing this. It's, it's, it's very interesting to me because um, I think we're, you know, I think these 10 years are probably the most like, consequential years of the next several thousand years. Um, so it's, it's the type of thing where you stop everything and pay attention, but I don't want to uh, involve my family. You know, it's my work, sort of speak. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, in doing this, I, I've seen that there is like something missing. Like, um, so, so, you know, I could charge for Bitcoin, but people are going to have to trust that this is laser hodl and they know my voice. So that's useful. Mm-hmm. That's like an identifying element, but there's a big problem with imposters and like spam bots. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's funny in the same way that the Great Reset attempts to create this centralized like biometric digital identity that, that you, you, you like log into everything. You know, as you're walking through town, you're logging into the store automatically. When you get online, you're logging in with that government login. Um, I think that like the, like the cypherpunk economy needs something like that, but, but like a sovereign digital identity an identity where you hold the keys in the same way you hold your Bitcoin keys and you can log in to prove. So I could have like a laser hodl digital proof that I log in to prove that it's me. This is authentic content. And, and that would eliminate um, this, uh, like a, that's the next frontier that's needed in order to create this truly global economy based on freedom. Um, it, uh, one of the uh, companies, there's a project out of Microsoft, um, I think Ion, they called it. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they came up with a prototype where um, you, you can create an identity proof, as many as you want. You can create you know, one for your real person, you can have three different names, right? But you created keys uh, for this identity proof, and then you use their tool and it would burn it into the Bitcoin time chain which is really interesting because that meant it actually made it where you had this identity proof that was immutable and censorship resistant. So it's like now laser hodl is like burned into the Bitcoin time chain. And like the more time that goes on, the more expensive it would go, it would become to make me not exist. And as long as I held the keys, I could prove um, that it was me. I could, I could sign messages. Right. And people would know that message really came from laser hodl. It wasn't some fabrication. You could take, you can go further with this. Um, if you were a tech service, you could integrate against it and you could make it where you logged in instead of with user password, you logged in with the identity proof. So imagine having one pair of keys and you logged into Twitter and chat and every platform you use 
and every, and 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 that's super compelling but it, it goes further like you could centralize well centralize is the wrong word but you mm-hmm. could create a service that allows for followership um where okay i used a tool to follow um cedric and every service that we share let's say we both use twitter i automatically follow you and i know it's the real you and i don't have to get in that game of who's an imposter who's not so, so I think that the internet needs this, uh, the cyberspace needs this, the sovereign ID. Um, I know that the lead from Microsoft, Ion, I must be butchering that, mm-hmm. he he joined um, uh, Jack's new startup, TBD. And TBD uh, doesn't have a name yet, but I think they're aiming at building a decentralized um, Bitcoin exchange and a sovereign ID. Mm. So it if they launch sovereign ID and we started to see adoption of that, um, it's a big deal. Cause it means, you know, you could extend this all the way to, okay, let's say I have a ID proof that I use to negotiate my arrangement with a free private city. And when I show up there, instead of a passport, I sign, I sign, I, I basically um, prove to them that it's me by using my ID proof that I custody, I hold those keys. And they say, yep, this is you. This is your contract. Welcome to the free private city. So you could actually um, uh, manage the way that you domicile your family um, in what jurisdiction that way. And and it's important that it's sovereign ID, right? It's important that you hold the keys and you can make as many identities as you like because that's what ultimately fr- keeps the individual um, on top. It's what It's what maintains autonomy. When you end up with these centralized systems where you can't escape the ID and they're attributing stuff to you based on your actions, that's inescapable. That's a perfect prison. So um, as a NIM, I realized I need that, right? Because um, I use a bunch of platforms and people want to know if it's me and and, and like having a way to, to show, hey, here's where laser hodl is. It's the real laser hodl. You can follow me. I, can lo- I don't have to have all these username and passwords. I can prove it's me. Um, I have a, a mathematical way to do that. Um, now, and, and I could do the same, you know, I could have a, a physical identity for meat space, you know, when I go to a free private city and say, okay, this is me. I'm the one who made the contract with you. Um, and so uh, like that really is critical. And I think this decade, we're going to see the launch and maturation of that tool set um, because we need something to, we need something to balance the type of stuff that the Great Reset is bringing with this um, high fidelity, inescapable biometric system. Right. Yeah, uh, it's scary stuff. And one of the things I, I love your um, your pin tweet: "Become a Bitcoin Lion." Uh, get on zero fiat. We could do a whole show on that. Dump vegetable oils. Eat organs, seafood. Get loads of sun. Live, climb, hike. Become hard to kill. Raise cost of tyranny take back privacy, read every day, reject victimhood, zoom out. Um, I I, I think that tweet sums up a lot of different things. And so my, and and, and like I said before, the get on zero could be a whole conversation of itself. So my my final question or my two parts, uh, one, how has Bitcoin changed you? Yeah. Um, it's completely reprogram my worldview, my value system. The um, I, I think that the, the it kind of imbues personal responsibility as a core tenant, um, in a way that in a way that society kind of relieves you of. Um, you you don't fully appreciate it until you take the orange pill. You start to realize I secure these keys. I I choose when this wealth moves i choose where these bitcoins go and um in the same way i think that um having large wealth leads to families creating like a family office and they start thinking about their family line on the order of centuries they start thinking about lineage they you start you know it's almost like bitcoin immediately moves you up maslow's hierarchy of needs you're immediately launched to where you're thinking about these higher order things um, as if you really do, you know, it's, it, it, it's like you immediately realize you've granted yourself full autonomy. 
um, that you could that you could leave the nation state, that you could, and, and suddenly your priorities shift because you're like, well, I should be thinking about my future, <laughs> right? Like now that I'm way up, now that I'm way up uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, yeah, well, what's going to give meaning to my life? I should start thinking about my family line. I should start thinking about um, the way the world is changing and, you know, start involving myself in, in, in the most important things that are happening to our species. Um, it's almost like the Great Reset and, and money printing. It forces people down that hierarchy. So you're just worried about your base needs and Bitcoin immediately resolves that. Uh, but with it comes a whole rush of responsibility that, um, you have to charge at, and if you do, it'll lead you. I mean, it's a hell of a rabbit hole. But for me, it kind of le- it, it's the realization of how much of our world is influenced by this fiat mindset and and, and fiat itself. And so, all the way from uh, the way that we live, the way that we think about debt, the way that we structure our careers, the way we structure our marriages, the type of food that we eat, um, uh, uh, the way we think about health, all of this stuff, like you start to see the fiat in it. And you start to realize um, that uh, our ancestors knew a lot um, and a lot has been papered over. And, and, and so suddenly you have this unstoppable money and uh, it gives you this mind space to start looking into the other areas that feel a little suspicious. And, and, and uh, that's where like, you know, things like eating plenty of whole animal products and getting loads of sun and, and um, even things like fasting and things like, um, uh, getting away from high high uh, arch support in tennis shoes that cramp your your um, your toes and um, and uh, recognizing that cities are you know that's that's an, an artifact of the industrial age and and the, that the pendulum of this uh, of this long cycle is swinging away from those and that's part of why they're kind of going hail mary on the great reset to try and uh, fight gravity and so you you know you kind of it suddenly awards you the, the vision and, and, the, and the ability to place yourself um, in, 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 a, in a light of responsibility and a light of seriousness that you couldn't when your money is disintegrating, when your time is disintegrating. Yeah, that's tremendous. And I agree wholeheartedly. My final question for you, and really, I mean, this has been so dope. I've appreciated it so much. I've learned a lot. Uh, I'll definitely leave it to you for any parting words and where people can find you. But one last thing is, uh, what about Bitcoin end? What is your end? Uh, and, and how do you think I mean, people should have more than just Bitcoin in terms of uh, what their thoughts are and their activities are? So what is your big end and, and what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, Bitcoin is so exciting what it represents and, and, and how it's it's um, it's really the base layer of society reworking itself back around individuals and families and cementing that. Um, but you need, you know, you know, it's, it's, they say it's, um, you've seen the meme, like unlimited divided by 21 million. That's the, that's the value. Um, when they're saying unlimited, you know, that's the value of Bitcoin. They mean that the, the, the value of all goods and services, Right. And so um, if, if we just had Bitcoin, then it would be zero over 21 million. Right. If there were no goods and services, you would have nothing to measure well against. So um, it, it's it's paramount and fundamental that you think of your lineage and your family line in terms of what is the value you're providing to the world. Um, yes, there's this decade. I think, you know, you, you might be able to just um, uh, ride the Bitcoin wave. But at some point you have a responsibility to, um, uh, uh, to, to make a reputation um, for your household. And, and that implies producing, producing some good or service. Um, and I think that uh, uh, the future we're facing is very diverse. So I think there's all sorts of room for, for sort of high tech, for, for business, even for like small artisanal scale stuff. So I, you know, there's uh, certainly there's room in, in food, you know. Um, I think the biggest opportunity is realizing um, we won't know the, the true cost of a sat until um, not only when, um, you know, all the, all the wealth in the world that is seeking just to hold its value, a store of value, not only when that's gone into Bitcoin, but when all the fiat industries, all the soft goods and services have been washed out by hard goods and services, only then will you know the purchasing power of a sat. And so that's the opportunity. 
it, it's, it's basically seeing that these soft industries are going to get washed out. These fiat industries are going to get washed out with what? That's the question. And so if you start to um, opine, you start to theorize on what, what the lifestyle of a Bitcoiner will be, um, that's, where you, that's where you would entrepreneur, right? And so um, for me, like a Bitcoin and, um, I, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of physical like, like sports in, in my leisure time and, and done a lot of lifting and like take, taking, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, as someone who's in software, which is like a high stress job, you need some like heavy exertion to relieve that stress. And um, I, I found climbing in 2020 and, and I firmly believe there's, there's not a better, uh, there's not a better sport for modernity. It, 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 it completely reverses like that crouch forward nerd neck position that we all have from staring at devices. It's a full body workout that feels like, um, like you meditated after. I mean, it feel it com- any physical stress that, that might be held in your body is completely removed. And so um, I, what about the I, risk I, level? Uh, it's, it's not what you would think as an outsider. When you watch, it seems like a lot higher risk, but when you're actually do the sport, you take little baby steps and, and you actually progress a lot slower than, than can be appreciated from the outside. So when you see guys like um, climbing a mountain without a rope, like I don't think, you know, very, very little people ever progress that would, or even desire to go that direction. Most of the sport is like people inside gyms and a very safe contained uh, environment. And then, you know, there, there's a smaller segment of people who like treat outdoor climbing, almost like a camping trip, right? Let's mm-hmm. go here, plan the trip. And, and even those routes are not so different than the gym these days. They're planned, they're pre-bolted. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so you, if you have the skills, it's, it's safe. And so I think for me, like, um, you know, I've, I've had a full career where I, you know, did the high stress and, and, and did the, the, the the sort of software thing and so i could see like a second leg maybe doing a climbing gym could be fun um the, to, to, to me you want to base it in a thesis for the sovereign individual era right so if you think a certain business or there'll be a need um i i, I think so like for me i could imagine uh being in a free private city operating a climbing gym with a cafe attached. I think that'd be really fun, fulfilling for me and my family, awesome for kids. And I could see other people being attracted to that because as we get deeper in the technology age, you need something to combat that little curled over, you know, wretched, wretched (laughs) position that we're all in so much of our time. Um, And so uh, that's given me huge meaning. And and, and that's like, I, I could see, I could see doing something like that, but for now, I'm kind of like retired and, and watching the geopolitical thing, watching the Bitcoin thing, watching this era come to an end. Um, and I have to do it through a name because you could imagine if I talked to anyone in my real life, told them what I just told you, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that it would, uh, it, I would probably estrange myself from, <laughs> from them. So, um, y- you know, I, I think, I, I, I think this is what's kind of like, in front of us, the opportunity is so massive to, to, to visualize what you think that economy will look like, what that world will look like, what that will mean for you and your family, and where do you place yourself within that? Um, I, I, I do firmly believe that people end up leaving the nation state in the end. You, it's this big, top-heavy system that, um, that it's going ha- to be like this really painful phasing out. And so the most productive people, they're going to want to relieve themselves of that burden. Um, and I think there'll be vitriol towards the productive in the end too. So I think, um, it, you know, these private gated cities, <laughs> I think is where we're headed. And I think they will be flourishing there and I think it'll be exciting. And, and, and so I don't know about you. I want to be in the private gated free cities of the future. I don't want to be in the, um, in, in, in a failing nation state where people are trying to figure out why why it's failing. Um, that's not where the excitement is. Um, at the same time, I think you might actually get these cities in, in the nation state. I think you could see something in the U S right now. I like LATAM in America. Like I look at the whole world in terms of the great reset and I'm like, Hmm, mm. potential in LATAM, some of these islands and potential in the U S surprisingly that, that federal system, that, 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 that governance system based on federalism, you know, that might be the only reason that Bitcoin succeeds in the end. Like it bought it, it was enough of a bulwark that it prevented the absolute unlimited overreach of the state and the great reset that you might, you know, 
we might credit America in the end as like the reason Bitcoin had enough time to win. Right. Yeah, that would be interesting. I, I feel somehow that America is behind it. Maybe that's I'm not really a patriot in the sense of uh, I don't really believe in, in nation states as a, as a construct overall. Um, but I do recognize that uh, I'm a citizen of the United States of America and I, I do benefit from when America does well, I guess. So, uh, you know, I, I probably have some sort of uh, inherent bias there. But um, I, I do like the idea of Bitcoin being the American dream 2.0. Um, yeah. and, and I like the idea of balkanization going forward. And I, I, I can't imagine if the nation, if America fell in any regard on, on, all 50 states in terms of freedom, I, I think that would just be a very dark place for the world. Well, look, there's a there's a non-zero chance that um, that Bitcoin either came from a small sliver of patriots that that were left within the state, saw that they saw that the United States was going to be losing um, global dominance, losing the dollar reserve. And they kind of realized, OK, well, if we can't have it, no one will. And they destroyed the entire fiat uh, uh, monetary system uh, by unleashing Bitcoin on the world. And, and you know, th- there's a non-zero chance that the U.S. government is uh, Satoshi, right? And that mm-hmm. they own a, a, a generous share, not enough to matter, but a very generous share, enough to allow them to reinvent we- themselves. In that world where America was able to maybe rebuild hegemony with Bitcoin as its... its, its uh, reserve currency and and regain its status as the number one empire would that be a a good thing for the world in in terms of continuing the american experiment Um, um well i think okay let me start by saying i think it's a very tiny chance yeah i agree i I just can't imagine that because i used to think that a little bit but i just can't imagine that if that happened that they would be able to keep the lid on the secret but Maybe uh, I'm disregarding that, you know, whoever created central banking and credit creation was able to keep, keep the lid on the secret for 400 years. So, right. yeah. well, so I think where the game theory goes is even as even if nation states decide we can't beat them, we join them. So we're mm-hmm. going to start buying Bitcoin. What will happen is it will ultimately under the, undermine their own ability to money. Right. Um, and, and, and so that will shift uh, like that'll shift us into a place where explicit taxes have to be used to fund the government entire in entirety, which would mean that the real tax rate would finally show itself. And it's probably, you know, in reset, mm. it's probably something like 99%. Um, but uh, you know, history shows that when you have a tax rate, that's like, you know, uh, into the 70s, 80s, 90s, it, it can't last before people will topple their own government. And so um, it, it basically creates, it's a phase shift that will create a feedback loop that causes the state to shrink itself or the people to shrink the state. Um, and you end up with a competition amongst nation states to become leaner. Um, uh, uh, instead of subjects, people, uh, citizens become customers. Um, and so even if the US said, we can't beat them, we'll join them, uh, and we're going to stack sats, um, you, you still you still end up in a place where it, it is learned by the world that the, the government has become too top heavy and people finally have the discussion that they're not willing to pay for that. And uh, and that begins the game theory of a, a, a competition in lean governance. And that leads towards the privatization of governance, which leads towards um, people uh, domiciling in the jurisdiction that uh, provides the best services for the smallest amount of money. Like it, it, it basically turns the world into a free market. Um, and, and, and so the U S could um, the best it could hope to do was compete with a good head start in that free market, but it would lose its monopoly on subjugation over citizens uh, fast. Um, and, and so, so, you know, maybe this takes a hundred years. Yeah. Maybe it's this entire century is the dance between the sovereign individual rising these little tiny lean governance and the nation state slowly becoming irrelevant as the productive leave it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe the United States is able to subdivide into lean governances that slim itself down and people stay, you know, I could see a balkanization lead to a regionalist, like a breaking apart of the U.S., Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think that's what you would want if you were 
you know, I love the American story. I'm American. I, I love it. So I would love to be able to like um, uh, uh, see, see the show keep going. And, and I think, you know, that is viable. It's viable to see um, uh, uh, parts of the U.S. become well, politically entrenched in regards to Bitcoin. I could see the normalization of Bitcoin um, happening now. You see the states taking it up. You see Arizona put out a legal tender um, a proposal. You see Texas and Florida talking about mining business. You see Wyoming. Um, I could see it becoming a 2024 election issue where uh, Trump is forced to support Bitcoin um, on a Trump versus Hillary card. Um, and, and so this, you know, I think a lot of like cypherpunk Bitcoiners kind of do not put enough stock in the thesis of normalization and political entrenchment. I think that, um, you know, the game theory doesn't just, you know, that's kind of where Sailor is. Sailor's like, hey, it'll become politically entrenched. And over time, the, the nation state will sort of be reprogrammed around it. Right. Like that's where we're heading. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of, that's his kind of stance. And and. Some people say, no, you know, that's not pure enough. We need to topple the nation. And it's like, listen, I think the game theory enters through the front door. I think it enters through the window. I think it enters from every, every crevice. Um, I think that that's how this works. Um, and uh, yeah, I would be surprised to see if the U.S. couldn't adapt or didn't. Certainly the red states seem, are, are, are there are signals that suggest the red states are going to get on board. Um that'll create a dichotomy where you have increased misery in the blue states Mm. getting more and more miserable. And then at the same time, you'll have increased flourishing um, in the red states. And, and, you know, as much as fear is a, is a strong element for uh, 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 like leading people, like getting people to do what you want, um, flourishing is far more attractive than fear is coercive. Um, so you, 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 you start having flourishing in parts of the U S that's going to create an excitement engine and people are going to be attracted to that. And, and it's not hard to see how you could end up with like a Bitcoin Renaissance, um, where, you, you know, you, you, part of the U S is, is really thrilled leaning in on Bitcoin, um, and, and decides to balkanize further. And, and for that reason, I'm still in the U S cause I'm like, mm-hmm. where does that lead? Um, but, but zoomed out, I think on the hundred year scale, you still go to, very lean, slim jurisdictions that you treat your your uh, citizens like customers and not subjects, and I and, and that, that that's where this goes. So even though the Great Reset's kind of freaky to people to talk about, like I can't believe the revelations of this thesis. Um, well, I think you can still be really is psyched and bullish and, and thrilled about being like, there's never been a better time to be alive. The great reset doesn't really need your help to fail. Like that's a bad idea <laughs> to try and capture the human spirit and like create this kind of high tech, you know, black mirror communism. Like that's not, that's not good. Everyone productive in who cares about freedom, I think is going to be able to simply opt out, simply say, that's nah, not for me. That's not for my family. I think there'll be plenty of places to go. And so it's just be like, be aware of we're going through a monumental shift in terms of uh, this, our species, in terms of how governments work. Um, and, and it's because we're going through a shift in money. Money is, is what underpins all of it. Yeah. It's so difficult to, to comprehend the shift in money though. I mean, we just, we're fish and water. We work for money. Uh, we're just trying to get through our day. But I love the optimism. Uh, I do agree that in the end, I think Bitcoin wins. And and I have a lot of long term optimism. I think we go through this window where we find these slivers of freedom and, and like minded people until Bitcoin wins out. And I don't know if that takes eight more years or 82 more years. Um, yeah, I want to think that technology accelerates it. So where the Roman <laughs> Empire, the Roman Empire took centuries to fall. Um, and, and until you had a renaissance, I'd like to think with technology, yeah. you know, you remove a zero, maybe instead of uh, 300 years, it's 30 years. And when right. did that start? Maybe that started 12 years ago. Yep. And, and yeah, I, I agree with that in terms of uh, Bitcoin is built on top of the internet. It's native currency to the internet. And you, we saw how quickly the internet uh, took hold and grew uh, way faster than technologies before it. Uh, I love this idea, though, just that we can opt out and opt into Bitcoin and opt into uh, free private cities uh, looking for free markets, free money and, and free people. Um, uh, you know, I just 
I think it's a very confusing time that we're living through. And I think that your thesis, your hypothesis, really, uh, I, I walk around a lot just saying a lot of people when they have questions or, or they bring up topical or current events, it's just, we got to see this through monetary reset. Just use that lens. Uh, it yep. is confusing by default. It is a lot going on. But if you use that as your your thesis, I think a lot of things fall into place way more so than if you get you know, sort of caught up in, in the, in the trees over the forest. So uh, yeah, you I, don't, you don't have to do what I do. Like I go mm-hmm. real deep trying to understand and like connect it to the history and, 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 and like try and making sense geopolitically of it, but you don't even have to spend your time that much going that deep. Right. Right. It's, it's enough to know that what you're experiencing is about the monetary system. <laughs> and that's why it's going to last this whole decade um and and you know and, uh, you know um th- this whole agenda is is fairly dumb and it's destined to fail you might as well start kicking ass in the bitcoin air mm. yeah uh, i i yeah i think those are great words to end on it's really about you know launching the bitcoin era for the individual and, and allowing the nation states to opt in when when they are ready um so laser hodl I, I i can't tell you how much i appreciated this conversation this has been so dope i've been looking forward to this a long time and it's definitely exceeded my expectations um the, i leave it to you for any parting words and definitely let uh people know where they can find you i know that you're gonna be focusing on writing going forward so let people know where they can find you and, and your your current work and, and your future work uh so folks know where to find me i'm on twitter at laser hodl I have a site coming up soon. I'm going to shift into long form writing. I think that the, um, you know, I'm kind of looking at maybe writing like a history book from the point of view of the future, kind of like the sovereign individual um, that, that, that digs into this, the, this mega political shift from the era of the nation to the era of, uh, of the Bitcoin individual and um, all the things that the state tried to do in the end. <laughs> And when they ultimately um, lost dominance to families, to individuals. So um, I, I think that's where I'll kind of direct my efforts. I've probably done 100 hours on pods at this point because um, I just felt a calling from within when COVID started. And I started to connect it to the monetary system that people need to hear this because people are so fixated. They're, they're stuck reacting to all this, um, these these psychological ops. So they're they're exactly where, um, uh, 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 where you know, you're exactly in a place where you are in a holding pattern. You aren't. You are reacting. So I needed to help people zoom out and realize um, this is about the monetary system. This is going to last this whole decade. They have a lot of plans to upgrade the government. No COVID bombshell is going to change that. Um, <laughs> and uh, you, you should start focusing on what comes after and positioning yourself for it. Yeah, I'll paraphrase paraphrase you on our, to roll out. Your job is to overcome risk, not avoid it. Um, and I wish everyone the best of luck as we go through this transition. It's a very confusing time, but um, you've definitely shed a lot of light. Thank you so much, Laser Hoddle. Thank you, Cedric. Laser Hoddle on authoritarianism as a school of thought, monetary colonialism, and how to be a Bitcoin citizen right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. This episode was brought to you by Citadel Cabins, CypherSafe, Ledin, and the Bitcoin 2022 conference. If you take your Bitcoin security seriously, go that extra step and secure it from physical disaster with a Cypher wheel seed storage device. Go to cyphersafe.io and use the code matrix for 10% off your order to keep your sat safe. Citadel Cabins exists to help individuals achieve shelter, rest, security, and location independence. Head over to citadelcabins.com to fill out an application now. Ledin.io is a secure, simple, and easy to use platform for managing and growing your digital wealth. If you want to see what it's all about, you get $50 in USDC when you take out your first Ledin loan. Head over to start.ledin.io forward slash Bitcoin matrix. Bitcoin 2022 is the largest Bitcoin event in the world that takes place April 6th to 9th in Miami. All four days will be jam-packed with exclusive content, exciting announcements, and an incredible lineup of Bitcoin speakers, artists, and experts. Make sure to use the code BitcoinMatrix at checkout and get 10% off your order, and I will see you in Miami. And thank you for listening. 
Stack sat, stay humble, and stay laser focused out there. This is Cedric. Peace.